for being here and let's start our interview first of all uh, about your i think childhood uh your favorite artists and your first instrument and um favorite singers like musicians all this thing yeah uh i grew up with things like you know fleetwood mac being played Mm -hmm. um in the background you know my parents uh records things like that uh tusk that was something that was i, I loved that song cool. um and uh you know stuff like that even some uh you know david bowie and um devo and uh you know things like that that were just on in the background even um who is it uh uh oh gosh who's the guy who did the video with chevy chase a long time ago paul uh oh he's kind of like folksy paul simon oh, um paul like simon Garfunkel. yeah 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 so paul yeah. simon was played a lot so this is just what was being played around me mm -hmm. but it's um you know when i i was i was into science fiction and i was into um you know i i guess media if you call it that now they call it content which is they've just dehumanized it so much but i was into media and stories i was a big reader i could read really really well at a really young age and um i uh you know star wars came out and just holy shit just changed my life you know and i saw that star destroyer going across the screen and just not ending and i was really really little and i still remember i mean really little like maybe five or four or something mm -hmm. and i remember it clearly i remember what movie theater it was i remember standing in line at the valley plaza in bakersfield california which is a small town in the middle of california that's mm -hmm. um still kind of a you know crappy place but definitely spawned a lot of incredible music that changed the world uh, you know with porn and edema and us and all this kind of cool stuff that came from bakersfield and buck owens and dwight yoakam and all this <laughs> cool stuff so i mean it was definitely they used to call it nashville of the west so you know there was definitely something going on there but when I was a little kid, you know, I remember standing in line and that movie, I think, really turned me or turned my head upside down and really showed me like that there is this storytelling. There is this thing called imagination. There is this thing called media. You can you can create the things that are in your head and you can tell those stories. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I started to, to get old enough to have a clue, um, I liked a lot of new wave. And then I also fell in love with heavy metal. So um that new wave, you know, definitely started turning into Depeche Mode and The Cure. Um, it, it went from more pop new wave that you hear on the radio, and then it went more into uh, Depeche Mode, Cure, um, um, all the cool bands. It could be Dead Can Dance. It could be any of the, the deeper cuts, Bauhaus, uh, Joy Division. Sisters of Mercy, for example. Sisters of Mercy. Yeah, that was even that was even later for me because I'm, I'm from such a small town no one had sisters of and, mercy <laughs> like the, um, the thing is, is uh, like we have slightly darker part mm -hmm. of this you know new wave and slightly mm -hmm. kind of lighter and yes. special and yeah, yeah it's like for example alphaville or mm -hmm. drum Run and uh, Aha, mm -hmm. it's more kind of lighter and like mm -hmm. the cure the sisters of mercy it's like yep. darker more goth you know yeah yep. so i definitely the radio turned me on duran duran um alphaville um aha uh -huh. I, I loved all that but i wanted to go deeper and when i when i heard the dark side i was like you know i always liked darth vader and uh <laughs> i always liked black and i always like so when i heard I the cure and stuff like that those were albums that i just would i would just drink them you know i would listen to i'd marinate in them in in disintegration marinate when i heard kiss me kiss me kiss me i was on a vacation with my family and completely miserable because i didn't want to go on vacation with my family i was a little kid and uh -huh. i had a walk man and I had um, uh, the the cult album with fire on it. And I had um, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me. And I think I probably wore those two tapes. I, I wore a hole in them. I mean, I, I, I'm i surprised they, they worked. I listened to them under the covers in our cabin, cool. like cool. for hours and hours and hours. And those just kicked my ass. And Billy Duffy's guitar tone and Ian Astabury's voice and everything. I was just like, wow. wow. Yeah. And just, just killing it. And um and I also started getting into Slayer and Metallica, obviously, when Injustice for All came out. I mean, I was in my room just going like, what the hell? You know, Injustice for All. And I was a skateboarder. And so wow. that whole culture was becoming my thing. So like the cure. Anthrax. 
especially like it, anthrax it thrash metal feet, yep, thrash Gordon yep. state of euphoria yep. that's it yep yep garage days uh, metallica i remember yeah. building my first skateboard ramp in front of my house and playing garage days over and over and over it's only like five songs cool. so yeah this thrash metal um and then i i remember i had this little tv um in my room this little rabbit ears tv because that's how you had tv back then and i mm -hmm. thought having a tv in my room i was like whoa i'm a grown-up and i would watch um arsenio hall and megadeth was on arsenio hall and oh. it was like when that kind of that music was starting to become commercial and like this heavy metal band was on Which Arsenio year? Hall. What? Oh, I mean, this is late eighties, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe 80, 80, 89. Um, cause I graduated in 91 or 92. So it had to be so in the late eighties. I think rust in peace era. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You hanger 80, oh. hanger eight. Or whatever, yeah. And I could play it, and I'm like, so when I saw it for real, because there was no way I didn't even have MTV yet, because I we didn't have cable. I had I had rabbit ear transmission, so I only got I only got the most primetime shit. And later on, when we got MTV, that was a game changer because then I started seeing how people were putting their hands on the guitars and then i would pick look at a guitar and put my fingers there and it sounded the same Ooh! Wow. so then i was like oh you can just do this because there was no one around me that played you know Ooh. so um then um at that point um i met a guy in high school that was kind of like the heavy metaler and he could play drums and um I remember we got locked out of the gym and he he did a drum beat on a metallica beat on the door to get let back in and i was wow. like you can just do that. He's like, yeah. Cool. And, and he, he had musicians around him and I didn't. So mm -hmm. I started hanging out with him and his brother and his brother was a really good guitar player. And that sort of unlocked my brain. I figured out that like any idiot can play the, you just have to get the gear. And so I obviously started, I, I got my first job at McDonald's and wow. I had to work for a fucking year to get like a $300 guitar. Cause minimum wage back then was like two bucks. What you know, was the first and, guitar? Uh, it was a West tone. Okay. A West tone. And I had a little crate amp that did like distortion. Wow. And I was playing all the heavy metal stuff and, and, and the cure stuff. And then of course, grunge came out, Soundgarden and Nirvana and yeah, all that kind of stuff. And it yeah. kind of changed the whole thing and, and kind of mixed everything up. And I think that the orgy, the concept that created orgy was definitely born of us wanting to rebel against the grunge that's why we came out looking like duran duran and eyeliner and tight clothes okay. and you know kind of looking you know painted nails and all that kind of stuff and you know what when the, the, the funny thing is because when the grunge came right before the commercial success was all about the glam metal like the motley yep. crew the guns and road the yep. poison and it yep. was like all this like no yeah. now the yeah. stone temple pilots pearl jam yeah. and you are kind of no again yeah or kind of yep. makeup nails yeah cool yeah it's it's all this stuff that like um all these eras are created from people rebelling against the 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 dominant force mm -hmm. and yeah. i mean grunge was definitely an answer like a response to glam and it was like the polar opposite. It's always diametrically opposed. And mm -hmm. what we did was kind of go when everyone looked like they worked at a gas station, we were like, man, this is like, you know, and at this point too, I had played in some bands and my, my first kind of band that people paid attention to was called sex art. And the singer of sex art was a guy named Jonathan Davis, who's now the singer of corn. And so that, that was my first, that was my first band was with Jonathan. So I had this world-class, incredible singer. And that obviously made me kind of realize that, oh, wow, there are people in our midst that have this magic. And, mm -hmm. and I never thought of myself as anyone that had the magic. Um, mm -hmm. And we wrote some songs. Um, one of them is Blind, which, you know, obviously has become one of the biggest the, the songs in, in yeah, history, yeah. you know, it did. So, you know, we 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 wrote that. And when he finally when he when he joined Corn. Well, they weren't even corn yet. They they needed some songs to play and they played Blind as kind of like a thing to kind of break the ice. Mm -hmm. Well, we all know how that went. And, um, you know, and I think that um, at that point, corn was becoming very dominant. And in my whole group in America and in L.A., everyone was trying to sound like corn. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So, you know, it was kind of, they, they weren't massive yet, but they were enough to where they were so dominant. And when I met the guys that became Orgy, I think that my, my musical tastes, um, you know, this goth industrial kind of, I guess they call it dark wave now, all okay. these influences of my past electronic music, Depeche mode mixed with the heavy metal and you almost have orgy. <laughs> so gotcha. these, these ideas, be, you know, and then, and then of course we were like, well, corn is so dominant. Every one of these bands sounds like a corn copy and everyone dresses like corn. We mm -hmm. need to do something different. And we really wanted to just be, we wanted people to be like, what the fuck is this? You know, we really wanted that response. Like, what are they doing? And, oh, we got it. I mean, people definitely thought we were lame and stupid, but funny enough, um, Corn did not think we were lame and stupid and they came back and over the course of a year or so, they were listening to the music we were creating and, um, they ended up forming a label, um, under Warner brothers and they made us an offer and wow. we took it. Yeah. So they, they did the cool thing and they turned back around and took their friends and me who I've, you know, and, and all of us along with them and lifted us up on their shoulders. I and, didn't know the story at all. Yeah. Really super cool. cool. Oh, there I, I credit Corn and Jonathan and and all those guys with with anything I have. I mean, this house that I'm in and everything that I that I have, I think, is because um I mean, look, we played our cards right too, and we created music that was compelling. But corn, um, when a lot of people were kind of making fun of what we were doing. Corn was like, yeah, we remember what it's like when people made fun of what we're doing. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, and Jonathan got it because Jonathan comes from where I come from. He got the electronic side. He got the kind of like the feminine side, the the nails painted and eyeliner. And he still likes this stuff. Uh -huh. And so do they. And they stuck up for us and they took us out on family values. And I got to say that we flopped. Um, our singles flopped. People did not get what we were doing. But what kept happening, what were key people, um, we, we kept getting into situations where we would play, we'd get some eyes on us and we'd do our thing. And we had this defined, different, very thought out thing we were doing, this sound. And we were competent in it. And um, MTV saw it and they were like, you know what? And they, you guys need to come out here and play fashionably loud. And we were like, okay. And we played it with Kid Rock and Jay-Z. And uh, wow. after we did that, they go, okay, we want you guys to come to New York immediately. And we were like, what? Okay, <laughs> we're on tour. And the label was like, go to New York. <laughs> and so we had to like go to New York and we did a day of press at MTV. And then after that day of press, the the label um, or MTV was like, hey, you know, we'd shot a, 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 a video for Blue Monday. They were starting to catch on. They were like, this band has something. And um the people at Warner Brothers that got it, it was actually Warner Brothers had a lot of, um, at that time, it was, um, thank God, it was a lot of, um, this, the the higher up guys were gay and they were into electronic and dance music gotcha. and they got us. Like and EDM they got, a bit, yeah, huh? yeah, they got that we were like the heavy metal EDM, but yeah. we were doing this thing and this was transcendent. So you had corn that we slowly won all these little, these little corners. And then MTV got on board. And when MTV got on board and we shot a video, when they saw the video, they were like, oh, this is like, you know, they, they were like, this is competing with like Marilyn Manson and stuff, you know, in terms of communication, in terms of ideas. And um, of course I'm using words now that I didn't use back then, but um, they made us a buzz clip. And um, that means that you get played four times a day on MTV. At that time, MTV was the dominant. I mean, it was it was equal with radio. Mm -hmm. Well, when that happened, radio found out too and started giving the song another look. They, they moved on from our, our initial single and they moved into Blue Monday. Cool. And Blue Monday was a song people knew, but we made it different. We wrote a new chorus. We, we changed it completely. And it became a massive, 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 massive hit. And um, it was... You know, we were we were doing numbers that were bigger than Marilyn Manson and all this kind of stuff. So we were really hitting. Then um, we, um, um, sorry, I need to turn this on to uh, do not disturb. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, focus, uh, do not disturb. I'm getting like texts every four seconds, um, <laughs> texts and emails. So we we basically. Um, you know, Blue Monday was a smash hit. And at that point we started, you know, we were on TV all the time. So we couldn't even walk outside of our houses. 
you know, it was, it was heavy duty and we were touring constantly. And then we went back to market with our initial single, the one that flopped smash hit because at that point then everyone understood what the band was about what it was cool. and so then all of our singles worked and so you know it's it's an interesting thing you know both manson and limp biscuit had just used a cover to kind of break into the market too sweet mm -hmm. dreams for manson and faith for limp biscuit and it seemed like it was kind of like when you have a new weird sound and people don't get it it's a good way to get in the door yeah um, it's a it's a time-tested way to get in the door but, you know, our, our song, you know, our version what we did with Blue Monday was for a while, it was the biggest selling single in Warner Brothers history. So um, wow. Lincoln Park is the one that ended that. So um, with that Transformers track. Mm -hmm. So um, our songs afterwards were smash hits and we were on TV all the time and had high billboard placement and sold millions of albums and toured and did all the good stuff. And and it's largely, I think our, our direction and everything was largely born of that, that you know, electronic mixed with the heavy, heaviest stuff, yeah. rebelling yeah. against the dominant movement of the time. But the third album is a bit different. I remember it's <clears throat> heavier for sure. Yep. Uh, more darker, I believe, mm -hmm. right? The third album is a disaster. So basically, you know, the reason, unfortunately, that Orgy isn't um, playing, I mean, there is an Orgy playing, but it's just the singer. Mm -hmm. Um And, um, you know, it hasn't really been able to get really moving um, because, you know, unfortunately, I think that the band very, very much was all of us, you know, and there was a sound created because of everyone. And that sound just doesn't seem to be there as much anymore um, with with just the singer. Um, mm -hmm. And we were having uh, issues with, uh, you know, Jay really wanted to be more like heavy more like corn like the stuff they're doing now it's it's you know it's not really very weird it's not very orgy it's not very you know i think people loved us because of how unique we were and so the third album was very very much a result of this just tug of war the band falling apart and um you know jay just you know not really showing up for sessions and kind of going mia and everything and the, mm -hmm. and the band just kind of You know, they put that out on on their label and um, it was just uh, unfortunately kind of a mess. None of us really liked any of that music. We kind of thought those sounded like demos. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Amir and I very, very much wanted to continue. To, we wanted to go more electronic. We, we thought that that was where we should be going because we were already the leaders of that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now you have the beginning of Julian K. Exactly. So Amir, Amir and I continued writing, yeah, songs that that unfortunately we couldn't get our singer to show up for and um i started singing and i sang an orgy as well um and i sang a lot in orgy but um i kind of sang out of necessity in julian k you know i i never wanted to be the lead singer i was a guitar player is what i wanted to do but but your sound really incredible honestly because you know Thank like you. for me it's so uh... It's it's crazy to just listen to the records without analyzing from perspective. Oh, okay, that's the third way tilt. Okay, sounds cool, but if the soft palette it's raised a bit, you know, like it's really like I co mm. I'm coaching right now. I'm listening yeah. without yeah. Yeah. analyzing. I'm just like mm -hmm. I like the music, and when I was listening to Julie K, for me it was so weird because it's not about you know just just sing and that's it the, your style is really cool and the range is cool and and light and powerful and the head voice and connection and sometimes screaming and for me it was like whoa this guy Thank can you. sing and and really good so for me it was like surprise really wow. so how Thank you came you. with this I know approach how you were training or you were just you know like sink and that's it experiment and tell me the story behind this chester bennington um he's the one that in this room <laughs> he's the one that told me you know we were we were uh, we were really looking for a singer because we never wanted to not do orgy that was never our goal We never wanted to start another band. That was not our goal. Why would we want to do that? We're in the one of the biggest bands in America. Mm -hmm. You know, we were selling 80,000 albums a week for a while. I mean, why the Crazy. fuck would we want? Yeah. We we're selling out every show that we played was sold out. And uh, to us, we were like, why wouldn't we want to keep doing this? And we couldn't understand why, you know, Jay just wasn't 
coming to the table or wanting to, to, you know, for years and years and years, 10, 11, 12 years, he was, you know, off MIA. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up just kind of accidentally coming up with this, this, this music. And I started kind of singing on it. And Chester was like, dude, you need to just be the singer. Don't, don't look for another singer. Just be the singer. That he goes, you be the before dead by sunrise or oh, yeah it's before dead by before. sunrise this is okay. this is actually how dead by sunrise formed so oh, he man. goes he goes either you're going to be the singer or i'm going to sing in, in the band <laughs> and i go cool. well you're you're in lincoln park and 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 he's like yeah i know but i'll do this too and i was like well that i don't know how that's going to work and so on and so forth and that's very chester and he um he ended up coming in and working with me and singing on a bunch of our stuff with me and helping me kind of figure out how to approach getting these notes out and the kind of like the, the, the physical attitude that you have to have with your body, wow. the, the, the relaxation and where he pushes from. And, and that's some of the best vocal lessons I've ever got from one of the most incredible natural talents on earth. I mean, that guy does every technical type of singing imaginable effortlessly and no one showed him really but he's just a nat you know there's just only a few people in the world born like that yeah but he was able to communicate a lot of it to me maybe he didn't use technical terms but that's when i learned that the screaming that he does is different than the screaming that he would do if he was in a fight with someone you know and, he, and i was like how do you do that without losing your voice and he's like well it's different than what i do when i'm you know, when I, if I get mad and I'm yelling in a fighter, he's yeah. it's not the same thing. And that's when I, I had no idea. Cause I was, I was like, how are you up there going? <laughs> Blowing he's all, just too like, much. Yeah. He's like, just like you just did. And I go, what? And he goes, yeah. And then to sit here in the studio with him and watch him do it. And I get chills on my arm because it, it's just, it was so powerful he was just so, so incredible. And I still to this day haven't, I mean, I've worked with Melissa Cross. I've worked with, I'll probably end up working with you. Um, I mean, there's still so much that I have to learn, but he really opened up the doors for me and helped me become the singer that is on the first Julian K album. Wow. And he is buried in some of that stuff with me. Um, it is me. I mean, it's all me, but there are some stuff that he did, some screams and stuff. And it took me a long, long time. I think after his death, was when the screams really started coming out. And at first they were real screams because the album that we were doing, Harmonic Disruptor, um, when he died was right in the middle of that. And the album flipped into all about that, Got you know, it. and it became, it became me just screaming and crying. Like the, the, the last one, except the singles. Yep. It's like the studio. Yep. Yeah. Last one. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. So it's just, it's just, um, that, so what happened was then live, I had to figure out how am I going to do this live? And so, you know, we had, we had to come up with all sorts of different ways to kind of have like maybe the effect, you know, in the background on a track while I could kind of do it more softly. And then mm -hmm. that kind of didn't work. And, and, and it was hard. I had to really figure out how to do all this new emotion that I put into the, to the songs. And I had to go back to remembering Chester and back to figuring listening to his, in my brain, listening to his, his, his constant, you know, 10 years of hanging out together and being in bands together and, you know, years of being in Dead by Sunrise together and singing together on stage with him, which I mean, ha have fun there. You know, it's hard because when that guy gets going, you just got to get on and you got to go and you can't really fuck up. <laughs> he's just going to, he's going to improvise and he's going to do things bigger than it was on the album. And he's going to add parts and you just got to do it right. You know, cool. and you have to get, and I remember some of the best times when we would play parts of these songs, um, like the end of Letdown. And we would play it and we developed this thing where we'd look, be looking at each other, rocking out in the middle of the stage and eye, eye to eye and singing that the, the harmony perfectly together. And I just had to just try to remember all of these, like to do that. Where was my voice? Where uh -huh. was it? What was I thinking? Where was it coming out of? What was it? <laughs> what, where was I connecting? Or was I just letting go? And is that the way? And it turns out there is a huge component to letting go. Yeah. Um, because you have to relax and let go to be able to do this shit. You can't just be 100%. ultra focused on, on, Oh, it, you know, it's counterintuitive. Oh, you know, it is. Yeah, especially yeah. Letting go. The aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. There's a huge component of just being yourself. Um, and, and, and trusting that your tone is there. And if your tone's not there, then your tone's not there. And maybe that's just what God gave you. I don't know what to say, 
but um, there are people who can sing and their tone still isn't fantastic. So, and by the way, you can still make that work too. There's lots of bands where the singer is terrible, but he, th- it still works. So yeah, yeah. there's really, there's really no excuse. So basically um, um, I got this weird offer from, or request or kind of a conversation with the guys in edema for me and... that was so weird because <laughs> I, I know. know this band and honestly i i do like post grunge and alternative stuff mm-hmm. and this band was kind of always somewhere like there yeah. but not in my you know like cds or tapes yeah and in like watching your profile I was like, okay, Julian K. Or G. D. Like what? I I thought like that was the other, and then like Wikipedia, and okay, now you're in a demon. And for me, yeah. it was like today I was listening to the new single, mm. and mm. for me it was like, wow, what's yeah. going on? How is that? How does that? Well, they happen? they they basically have a similar situation. Their 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 singer unfortunately has a pretty serious drug issue, and which leads to all sorts of behavioral issues and Mm -hmm. um, they could never, you know, they had a lot of success and they could never really keep it going because the singer was not showing up and the singer was doing, you know, terrible things and being a terrible guy. And, um, you know, I've, I've been, I, for a while was trying to, uh, to get them to, you know, get back together as the original band and tour with us and Julian K. Cause I, you know, I always thought they were awesome and they're my friends. They're from Bakersfield. They've been my friends for 30 years. Wow. And um the 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 bass player was in my the band with Jonathan and I, Sex Art. So we were in our first band together. So I have deep, deep connections with them. In addition, they have a ton of electronic and synth elements to their music, and they're melodic. So I was like, this would be great with Julian K. This would have been great with Orgy, you know. Um, and uh we almost got it to happen with the original singer. And, um, I spent a lot of time on the phone with the singer and, um, he was like, you know, I thought it was going to happen. It's typically I can talk people into things because I'm not selling garbage. I'm usually selling something good. Okay. So, um, at the, at the end of a month of like being on the phone, the last conversation, he was like, you know what? I just don't really like this song, these songs in this band. I want to do a new band. I want to do this new stuff with you. And I was like, Wow, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. You are the singer of a band that sold a million albums. What is wrong with people? I'm like, I felt like I was dealing with the singer of Orgy, you know? And I was like, fuck, you know? And so I, I go, okay, well, I wish you would have told me that because I wouldn't have spent all this time on the phone with you trying to get you to go on tour and make a bunch of money. So um, I basically was like, okay, thanks. Goodbye. And I called the guys. I was like, guys, this guy's not, he does not get it. And they were like, yeah, this is this is what we deal with. You know, this guy will get offered a show with Rob Zombie and the guy will not show up for the show. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's crazy, really. And I go, well, I know what that's like. I know what that's like. So they keep getting offered big tours because they do have a name, but they didn't have a singer. And they called me and they said, would you mind coming out and singing on this tour? And I was like, (laughs) I don't know. Now, I've never been asked to sing someone else's songs. You know, I don't know. That's but you guys are my friends. And I talked to Amir about it. And Amir was like my partner in 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 in, in Julian Kay and Orgy and Dead by Sunrise. We're basically producers that front bands. The, the weird thing for me was I'm <clears throat> like a lot of the glam stuff. I'm a big fan. And <laughs> the rough cut band. Yeah. And for me it was like this guy from Orgy hair mm-hmm. metal band what's yeah. the connection so it was yeah. really weird for me yeah. he has he has we could be playing orgy shows or julian k shows and everything he has rough cut fans show up you know he's been doing this for a very long time um you know funny enough um hit posters of him he's a little older than me and posters of him were on my friend's walls you know when i when cool. i was growing up you cool. know playing but i wasn't into glam i was i kind of wanted to break that mold because i'm one generation just one kind of half generation behind him so yeah. maybe he graduated from high school when i was entering high school you know what i mean uh-huh. so that kind of yeah, yeah. that kind of era sort of passed maybe a little bit more than that mm-hmm. and uh and so you know he was old enough to be out there on the scene playing and he had success early on and he's been through all these different you know phases but what you find out with these guys 
that are like that. They aren't going through phases. The phases are going around them. Gotcha. He's all so he in in rough cut, he played a guitar synth and they mm -hmm. wouldn't allow that to be put on the albums because they thought that was too that was too not new too romantic and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it was not rock and roll, roll enough. Yeah. So it turns out the guitar guy who's a shredder has always been playing drum machines and synthesizers and always into electronics and always listening to Depeche Mode and always listening to Sisters of Mercy and always listening to you know <laughs> Bauhaus and always so it was never nothing changed for him. He's and he's always had a crazy cool look and always been into the fashion and the design. So I feel that a lot of people are like, oh, you're like a chameleon. And I'm like, well, no, actually the 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 business is like a chameleon. But the yeah. people that have with this artistic core that continues to sort of grow and go up and you're and you're loyal to the things that you love, you just find out that the universe is big. You can do all these different cool things and they're not they're, you're not acting. Yeah, but with electronic side of the music, you know, it's weird because a lot of like new metal alternative like bands for example like linkin park mm -hmm. with this band 100 th that works cool because like starting from the um minutes to midnight mm -hmm. and, and yeah like with R rick rubin and uh, more electronic uh, sound that's really good but unfortunately for example 30 seconds to mars for me it's so weird <laughs> And it's ending up with like, you know, like a DJ Jared Leto, like that's all mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. pure kind of Justin Bieber sound right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. There is no- It, it has like, turned into that, yeah. Because Linkin Park was always Linkin Park. The core, the, mm -hmm. the, the style, maybe slightly more elect electronic, less guitar, but it's still mm -hmm. the same idea behind yeah. the music. Mm -hmm. with 30 seconds to mars it's completely different you know yeah it's it's, so, it's completely changed yeah i was i was kind of shocked and, but and uh yeah I mean, jared's definitely weird. on an artistic journey that's weird. what's that yeah 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 i hear you i hear you okay and um about uh the edema so the the the, the tour was happening Oh, so we so we did the tour. Well, actually, before we did the tour, Amir goes, "Why don't you just go, you know, rehearse with them and see if it sounds okay?" So I went and rehearsed with them, and there were some people at the rehearsal studio, and I came in knowing the songs, and I did it, and everyone was super excited. And I called Amir, and I go, "You know, here were the comments. Yeah, they were like, it sounds like Trent Reznor's fronting Edema. Like people really liked it. Cool. And so he was like, okay, he's all that's that's good. He's also if you sound good with them, he's all, do you think you guys could do some new songs?" I go, well, it's the whole original band. You know, um, I think that they're capable of doing good stuff. I've heard the stuff that they've written and they have no singer to sing on it. And it's really cool. And he's like, okay, well, maybe he's all, I'll go with you guys on tour and we'll kind of help get this band honed up and maybe we can do an album with them and you can sing and that'll be a cool project for us to work on. Wow. And so I was like, all right, well, let's just see how it goes. So the first show we had fans coming up to me crying with tears in their eyes saying thank you for saving this band and i was like oh you know shit fans like the band and fans like me in the band initially on the internet fans hated me in the band they wow. said i mean because this is the way it is you know so i mean it was straight up like this guy is you know orgy you know he he these guys are pussies this guy wears eyeliner and paints his nails and i'm like oh my gosh this is just like the beginning of orgy i'm like i completely <laughs> I'm completely down with it. So I was like, okay. And uh, people were really, really like, fuck Ryan Shuck, fuck him, fuck Orgy. You know, you guys bring Marky back. And and I'm just like, well, guys, I'm sorry, guys, but, you know, as with Orgy, you know, we can't control the singer of the band. They, you know, we can't make him show up. So mm -hmm. sorry. Don't know what to tell you. I don't want to talk shit about these guys, but we're here to do the business. Let's see if you guys like it. So we went out with Power Man 5000 and Head PE and uh, and Edema and um, the shows were big. It was good. The response was really good. Promoters um, were hitting up the agent going like, hey, this new guy is really good. Like, where did you find him? And they're like, oh, it's the guy from Orgy and Julian K. And they're like, oh, fuck. Okay, well, those guys are good. And wow. maybe the fan base was bigger because like Edema fans plus Orgy, yes. Julian, yes, yeah. Dead by yeah. Sunrise, all these yeah. things like. Yeah, it was a good it was a good marriage, but no one knew. Everyone thought that I was going to sing, um, 
you know, like Orgy or like Julian K. I don't think the people understood that I could go up there and do this heavier stuff. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the tour, um, we were getting more tour offers and I was looking at my bandmate in a mirror and I'm like, fuck, I think I'm going to have to split time and I'm going to have to do Edema and Julian K because I'm kind of became the new singer now of this band and I didn't really mean to. And he's like, okay, well, we'll just do both like producers. We'll, 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 we'll split the time because, you know, Julian K doesn't want to be on the road the entire year. So, you know, I still have a lot of energy. I like to be athletic and go do it. I like to perform. So I'm like, all right, cool. Well, I'll play 150 shows a year. That's fine. Cool. So that's what I'm doing now. And the fans were still like, yeah, fuck this guy. You know, I mean, the fans that they hadn't don't... been there to see us live. Well, there's, you know, you go on tour and you play in front of what, you know, 15,000 people, you know, total for like a club tour. And there's still a million out there that hate you. So we recorded a couple of songs and um, we were getting ready to drop the songs, you know, putting the promo out. People are like, oh, you know, fuck this guy. It's not a Dima. You know, this sucks. Bring Mark. Blah. And we dropped Ready to Die. And um, everyone heard these like massive screams and all this like rad vocals and just really heavy music. And it sounded like the band Edema. And it they they could see that I was, the goal for us was go back to your roots, guys. Remember what it's like to be kids in Bakersfield. I'm from Bakersfield too. I grew up with you guys. Let's remember the music that we loved. Remember what we were thinking of don't rewrite the first two albums but keep them in mind because that's what made fans fall in love with you cool. and i'm keeping that in mind vocally i'm not here to add dancey electro elements to edema i'm here to make edema more edema than they have been in years and that's the single that we dropped the single blew up we did really well um there was a whole lot of taking back some you know some some jabs on the internet whole lot of people going like oh whoa you know this is ryan uh whoa you know and then and then the comments started shifting to like this guy might be better than marky and um, i still love marky but wow he is really good and then we did a um during covid we did i actually checked myself into rehab and got sober and wow. we did a live stream Congrats. we had a live stream where i had a lot of trouble with my voice because i i hadn't sang sober in 17 years Wow. And um, and so I did my and it was a really probably not smart of me to do. I probably should have done some real shows. But at the time, it was like a year and a half. There was no shows or nothing. So we did a live stream and I sang a lot of it. OK, but the screams I couldn't get. And so I was like, man. And so some people are like, wow, you know, can this guy do it? Or you're like, what's going on? And I'm like, fuck, we got to do this again. We got to go rehearse. I got to get this back. And we did another live stream where people could while they're watching it <laughs> they can comment and everything and um i fucking destroyed and i brought it i did all the screams everything and and people were like uh like people were typing in marky who and all this kind of stuff so it's not like i'm trying to beat the other guy all i've ever tried to do is do me but to do me that doesn't mean putting my own it doesn't mean being ryan and julian k in edema it means making sure that this band that I love sounds like the band that I love and that the things that I have to do, I have to be true to myself, but I have to deliver it in a way that works for the band that I love and this music that I love. Cool. So I think that it's, you know, your average person just doesn't get that off the bat. They don't understand that we can do all this different stuff. You know, I could also probably sing for Depeche Mode. That'll never happen, but I can do that all day sure. long. And, you know, if you're a singer, that's one thing, but you're like a producer and that's like yeah. when you are watching from the inside, outside. Yep. And that's why with Edema, it's completely different process. Not like, okay, yep. I'm the singer. My roots are like these. Let's work mm -hmm. with like, yeah, yep. like Depeche Mode and stuff like that. Yep. No. And I mean, I have both sides. I have the heavy metal side. You know, that's what I grew up on. But mm -hmm. I, I just, unlike a lot of my heavy metal friends, I was playing Slayer. And then throwing on Depeche Mode afterwards, you know, so I, I, I don't know why I'm like I am, but that's the way I am. So I get the hard stuff and I and I'm grateful for Edema because that started helping me um, figure out how to do this heavier side every single day on stage. And then that translated back into Julian K. So I started mastering the ability to do these screams that I in Julian K when we recorded them. I really was screaming. I was really, really upset. And, and um, I, I, I figured out a way 
you know, after working with Melissa a little bit and working out, you know, remembering Chester and then going out and doing it, touring is the great, it's the great teacher. Touring, I mean, people are like, you know, I don't understand the artists that just sit in the studio and just record. I've never really liked that aspect of, to me, you get better by going out there and and having an audience and doing it. You become a real band doing that. Yeah. I've worked with bands that are good, but you get them on stage and it's not really there yet. And um, and then you and then I keep telling them like, guys, we need to get you go play thirty shows in a row, because you will become literally in that month you'll become six years better than your than your 100%. friends that are staying home. One hundred percent. And so that's what I do. I've always done the crucible. I call it the live fire exercise. You know, live live bullets and. Let's go, uh, you know, like you want to, you want to be tested. And also and so, lack of sleep, lack mm -hmm. of hydration, mm -hmm. yep. lack of humidifiers, yep. all this like yep. the bosses, the airplanes, yep. time yep. zones, man, that's, yep. that's crazy. I mean, crazy. I, I have, unless I was at the peak of my career and there are a few times where I have been at the peak of my career, um, the stuff we did in Dead by Sunrise, obviously, you know, we got treated a lot different. The stuff we did at Orgy in our peak, I mean, we're in a, you know, two tour buses, a diesel, um, you know, we had, you know, hotel rooms and a bus. And I, I mean, so, you, you know, the whole world revolved around us, but that's this much. I've been doing this for 26, seven years. That's this much time, you know, Dead by Sunrise is this much time, mm -hmm. you know, um, the vast majority of being in a band and playing and touring is being uncomfortable. Yeah, the vast, but every day there is a huge portion of the day that is not what I want it to be. And you still have to make it happen. Exactly. You still have to exactly. get your own head right. You have to be able to go, okay, shit. Well, I'm not in a tour bus right now and we're not close to the hotel room. Um, I have to share a dressing room with three other bands because this club in <laughs> fucking Milwaukee only has one dressing room. And I mean, by the way, fine, no problem. And there's, you know, 15 people back here. Um, by the way, now I don't drink. So everyone's drinking, which I, I don't care. I'm just saying you have to be somewhere here. You know, like I'll turn around to a corner of the room in a chair and ignore everyone and do my vocal warmups with my phone next to my ear. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't give a shit. You know, I'll just be like, and, and the thing, the funny thing is, is these imaginary walls go up around you. No one comes and bothers you when you're, when you're together, when you have your shit, they, they're like, oh yeah, that guy is not someone you want to go fucking bother right now. He's doing his thing. He's a pro. And, and so you have to figure that out and develop it. And that helps you in the studio. That helps you. Like I have my setup here. I can't really move my camera because my mm -hmm. studio is set up mm -hmm. with cinema cameras <laughs> everywhere. So <laughs> gotcha. it's actually set up to do this kind of thing. We live stream all the time, but I have my, my mic is is attached to my desk and here's my workstation and all my yeah. outboard gear is all over all so around good. me. Cool. It's kind of like your 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 scene behind you, but um it's mm -hmm. it's a little 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 less stuff. But in here though, if I'm gonna be doing vocals, you know, which which I was just doing late last night, you know, I'm in here and here's my microphone. Uh -huh. I still have to get this little bubble around me. You still have to get, you have to get that. Like you're going to end up, you're going to end a, uh, a line. You're going to be singing a line. You're going to, you know, figure it out at the end like this or whatever. You're going to get all that breath in there and all the things that make it have personality And that you do that on stage as well. But how do you do it? You create this, exactly. you know, when I'm up there, I'm connected to everyone. And at the same time, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. I'm 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 using my microphone to make sounds. I'm I'm not cupping it and going, you know, that oh, kind man. of shit. That That's that shit. just sounds <laughs> terrible. But your microphone amplifies your voice and it has characteristics and things. And you can, you know, you can make Maybe screams please. happening happen by not screaming. You can make, you know, whispers sometimes can sound loud like a scream, and you can do all this cool stuff. So you only do that by getting your head right in your in your world and and be connecting consistent. with that thing that is that... all about consistency yep. like whatever you like recording live show like practicing at home the voice likes when you are consistent and do completely yeah. the same the warm is the yeah. same and the voice is ready to go like bam 15 yep. minutes and you're there but the problem is sometimes the voice is 
in a good shape, sometimes not, but you should deliver completely the same emotion and the message behind the music. And yep. the, the more you are technically, you know, kind of wise, the, mm -hmm. the, the more options you have to change something, yep. not to like, mm -hmm. and like I said before about the like bands, the, the, the studio bands, when something's wrong, they like, what I'm going to do now? Um, yeah. I, I just yeah. can't. If you're a live mm -hmm. guy, you know, okay, like I can go here, slightly here, maybe here, maybe here. That's the option. Yep. Yep. Cool. Yep. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you know, I always joke about when you're on tour, you know, and the other singers that maybe might, might be more green or having some issues. And I'm like, well, you know, you got to use the voice that you have today. That's the tool that you have. Like my, the thing that I lose first is my kind of mid always. So I could have the falsetto exactly. and the baritone and, and I the lose neck. the mid and, all the time. And you know what? Imagine this, you have low, <laughs> you have high, you have mm -hmm. mid and you have low mid and high mid. Yeah. Low mid, you can kind of be slightly more chaser, but high mid or yeah, which, it's not going to yep. work. Which you need good. all the time. You need high mid exactly. all the time. You know, that's like Money the meat and potatoes. Like so, G sharp A for mm -hmm. B flat yep. for yep. these. Nutty and then there's nutty. there's times where you just go, okay, well, this is the tool I have today. You know, my tool's not very really happy. And I just have to go and I have to do more warm ups and I have to do more, you know, I have to get it to where that that thing starts to happen. And then there's also just kind of the, you know, um, I used to get it through drinking, like I would drink and be like, okay, well, it's going to be okay anyways, <laughs> you know, but now I have to get it from somewhere else. And that still happens now. I just, you get that energy and the magic comes from the audience and you're able to pull some of the, you're able to pull it off that night. But there is a magical thing that happens when you do it every night and you don't cheat. You don't put a ton of vocals on tracks. You don't, you sing it, yeah. you know, I, the, tracks are a fact of life. Like we're an electronic rock band, both of my bands. There are synthesizer parts and drum loops that have to be on tracks unless you're going to do it the way that we did it in the original orgy. The original orgy played everything live. Mm -hmm. I, I We did things that you, that technically you couldn't go buy the gear that we created. You had to create the gear and it was hard, you know, and it was very difficult to do by the time we got really up and running and big, we had a team and it was, we got guys from nine inch nails and stuff from their crew wow. to, to help and prints to help make our, our world work because those were bands that were doing proprietary, interesting things live. Mm -hmm. Well, we were also doing, we weren't running track. We were playing and now orgy is, you know, unfortunately it's largely track, you know, and that's that I, and, and to, you know, to the dismay of a lot of fans, because I still think you have to do as much of it as you can live. If there's parts that can be sung, you need to sing them. You know, you and know that's what, what we do. Uh, you know, Clayton, uh, Soul Developer guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's a beast. And, yeah. And you know what? Like to to these days, it's so weird to me. Like every single year, I'm putting the two two thousand and three uh, self titled mm -hmm. album. That's one of my favorite. And it's every single year sounds to me like wow. It's it's still modern. It's not like you know, kind of from yeah. old days. And like, for me, it's so sad because before like 2003, maybe four, it was like a live band with drummer, yeah. guitars. Mm -hmm. And after that, Clayton said like, okay, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. Like it's he, more he, like a laptop. And, yep. um, the, uh, this he hates drummer. touring. He hates yeah, touring. Exactly. I have a lot of connection to those guys. And I know a lot of guys on that label and I love that label. And I love all those guys. I think, I think Seldor was great. Um, but the Annex is another really good friend of ours that is killing it, doing a great job. We're doing a lot of stuff with the Annex. In fact, we're on his first new single and everything. Mm -hmm. And he's doing really, really well uh, in the digital world. And he just doesn't, he hates touring, you know? And we try to get him to come out with us. And, you know, there might be, hell might freeze over. You know, these guys might do it again sometime. But I can tell you, they just don't like doing it. But, you know, they did do it. You know, they aren't, it's not like they're in their studios and they've never played. They have played, you know, they have played a thousand shows, yeah. you know, and I think that you do need to do a thousand hours of something to get yourself up or 10,000 hours or whatever the thing to become an expert. You know, you have to have like, I forget what that amount of hours it is, but I think it's very true. It's true with jujitsu. It's true with singing. It's true with, true with playing everything. live. Everything. You know, you got to put in the time. There isn't a hack. I know everyone's into hacking. 
now. Um, I think that hacking, it, you could translate to that, to understanding something better, mm-hmm. you know, because nothing, um, nothing replaces uh, hours put into learning. 100%. Even One, nothing... knowing the theory, yep. knowing all yeah. the theory, yep. there's, there's nothing yep. before you just go and spend the time. You can't buy yep. it. You just yep. you should do this. Yep. Yeah. And it's, and it's really, you know, I've actually sent a lot of my friends, um, uh, you know, I, I would kind of teach people here and there, like if they were, they're cool or I knew them, I could have them come in for an hour and kind of show them what I know, but I've actually ended up sending people to you and wow. at least to watch you or stuff like that. And because, um, you know, I, I, it's not necessarily my, my gig, but I, I told them, I'm like, look, here's people that I look at that are doing cool stuff because I'm always, I'm still like, I'm doing it. You know, I've got all the stuff you would. I've got platinum records and stuff over here. And I still am like, I mean, I treat my, I, I very much in a lot of ways act like a beginner. You know, I, I very much, if I see someone doing um, voicing, that's the right, that's right. And saying things that I need to clue into like you or any of the other people that I would follow say, that's what you do now, right? You use Instagram and Facebook and social media to pick up on other people who educate and stuff like that. And, and I end up following them and paying attention to what you have to say and what, and learning little bits and, um, and I was like, yeah, I'm like, here's the people that I follow. So just actually hire them or just go through all their Instagram because a lot of these people are so cool. They're putting almost their entire curriculum on Instagram, but you have to have the discipline to sit down and watch it exactly. and practice it. You know, there's everything's available now. You almost don't have to pay, you know, um, using this complicated software and all the outboard gear and stuff that we have, trust me, there is a YouTube video regarding every problem that you could have but you have to sit there and find it you have to sit there and watch it and then follow it and figure out all your own problems people many people don't want to do that unfortunately so you yeah. know and and that's people are laughing you know yeah. they're like yeah i just didn't you know i didn't you know growing up i wasn't around what you were around everything i'm like what i was around oil derricks i was around like de- i was in a field i grew up in a fucking desert field it Whoa. sucked. No one played music. It just, it sucked. You know, um, it's not true. Nowadays you have to, you know, I'm 50 years old and I firmly believe that, you know, you have to have a playful attitude towards learning. You have to have a playful, you know, jujitsu attitude. I, I mm-hmm. obviously train jujitsu because there's a lot of trans- translation. Yeah. So yeah. Cool. So that's a, that's a big part of my life. But there's a playfulness that you have to have in jujitsu towards learning and trying things that you know are going to get you beat. You're going to, you know, you're, you're, you're comfortable getting, you know, getting dominated. And because you know that if you do something, you're doing it on purpose, you know how it's going to end badly for you, but you're going to be okay. Then you're going to start <laughs> over and you're going to do it again. You're going to try, you're going to try another little thing. That's it's basically, yeah. it's a microcosm for learning in general. So we got to get in here. We got to pull up a session, even if you don't know how to use the shit and you got to start fucking recording things and you got to start singing into the microphone (laughs) because nothing happens when you don't, if you just sit and dream, if you're constantly getting ready to get ready, which I see everyone do. Oh, it drives me crazy. 100% really. You have to get after it, get after it, you know, start recording stuff and doing stuff and putting yourself out there and playing shows and becoming better. And, um, you know, do other things. Don't just do music, do jujitsu, do some things that get your brain and your body to work. And, you know, um, you'll start finding that they're all related and because it's all learning, you know, um, if you don't, if you can't find anyone or can't afford anyone to do your graphic design, all kind of stuff, then fucking get online and fucking buy Photoshop. <laughs> illustrator yeah. like like i do if you if you don't have anyone to make music videos and go fucking get da vinci it's free and get online and learn how to use it and fucking Especially use your iphone now now yeah it's like everything you know it's for yeah. me it's so weird when i'm thinking about guys from the 70s like you know led yeah. zeppelin deep purple all those guys how for example how they like ian pace was playing drums. That's incredible. It's completely different approach before yeah. and then now. Com- yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how yeah. those guys were singing, screaming, yelling, like you know. Now you okay, you know all the you, you can see what's going on right here. Yeah. Before it because was like guys like dragon. yeah, because guys like you have decoded it. 
<laughs> but but you know they they were doing it instinctively exactly and that's so yeah. cool like a chester bennington you know which i i just i it blows me away when i see the guys that are so good but even those guys i'm i'm learning that to do it at the level that they're at as often as as we have to do it you know 150 days a year of of performance i did 150 shows last year wow. so that was that was from like in my the band that bought that i was able to buy this beautiful house and this recording studio and all this kind of stuff and essentially ending without me wanting it to end you know because of one guy who just you know for some one reason or another just couldn't do it for years and years and years i'm back to playing 150 shows a year because fuck that i'm not going to i'm not going to stop i'm not stopping oh so cool i don't give a fuck I don't That's give a amazing. fuck. That's so not, amazing. You know, and there were years where I was only able to play 10 shows in a year because, you know, you're once you're once you're gut punched like that and you can't don't have the thing that put you on the map, then you start something new. Who cares about your new thing? No one cared about Julian K. They cared about Orgy, you know, <laughs> and then. When we started Dead by Sunrise with Chester, which was largely because of Chester trying to become the singer of Julian K. And I go, well, Chester, oh. he's like, he he wanted to play with us. He wanted to do something with me and Amir. And, um, you know, we were friends and we, you know, Chester and I would sit at, at parties at his house. And after everyone left, we would sit really late at night and play guitar and sing. And he would sing me these ideas. And I was like, well, instead of being the singer for Julian K. Chester, why don't we just create a band with you? where you can do the songs that you're not really doing in Lincoln Park. That way Lincoln Park can be the thing. That's number one. But we can do another thing that lets you get your stuff out and you can still work. We'll, we'll still work together and do what we do. We'll still write our weird stuff on it that you seem to like so much. Hmm. And um, But you don't have to be the singer of like Julian Kay, this like electronic band. <laughs> this would be like, you have all these songs. Why don't we just do one and see how it goes? And he's like, yeah, why don't you just... So he played Let Down in here in the studio. Wow. Sat down with the acoustic guitar. We put up one of these mics and we recorded one microphone, um, the acoustic guitar and him singing. Then he goes, okay, well, you guys just do whatever you want with it. I don't even know, you know, this song. I don't know what's going to happen with this song, you know, but Linkin Park doesn't really want to do this song and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. So he left and he came back and we worked on it all night and we turned it into this fucking became the first single uh, or the second single. And, uh, and an it's a great album. song. And when he heard it, he was just like, you guys did that with the the acoustic guitar you I just recorded? <laughs> and he was like, oh, my God. And he jumped up and down. And he ran around my house and he ran back in the studio screaming. He's like, we're a band. You know, we're a band. We're a fucking band. And so we went through a couple different name changes and ideas. And we kept recording his ideas. And, and it turned into a way for us to help him get the songs that were inside of his brain that weren't necessarily right for Lincoln Park because I mean Lincoln Park's a they're a juggernaut. You know what they're doing to what they were doing together especially was undeniably some of the coolest most groundbreaking stuff in the world. Agreed. And it's Agreed. still to this day. And um you know but Chester definitely had a lot more in him. You know, and that's why he sang in Stone Temple Pilots. That's why exactly. he sang. Exactly, that he, is what he like, wanted to do. It's amazing, amazing. Yep, and he and he wanted to do. You know, in his soul, he's a heavy guy. He likes to do hard rock, and so we were able to do electronic hard rock. Also, he's a Depeche Mode guy. So there's another thing. You, do. I mean, he's a he's an electronic guy too. So he likes all this stuff, just like us. He likes all this stuff. But he wants to be in a hard band. So as Lincoln Park was getting more and more going down these different avenues, he still had these songs that he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of how it, it came to be. And we ended up recording the Dead by Sunrise album and Death to Analog at the same time. So we were working on both back and forth. And wow, cool. Chester ended up moving into my house here for a while, a long time. He lived with me. And we would work in here in the studio and party and have fun and swim and cook and come back in here and it would be all day and all night. And he would go up to LA and work with Lincoln Park and come down here. And it was just a lifestyle. It wasn't, it wasn't like even the Dead by Sunrise and Julian K albums were, they were becoming somewhat interchangeable. We'd work on a Chester idea for a while and then we couldn't think of what to do. We'd go play Call of Duty, come back cool. and start, 
Julian K stuff and he would we would work together and he would kind of coach me on on vocals and or he would kind of go play and do stuff with his kids and we'd work on Julian K on our own and then we would start some Dead by Sunrise stuff and he'd come back in that night and we would do that till really late very very natural very wow. hippie very hippie commune kind of lifestyle you know um and we all lived here him and Talinda and Fu and um, and his uh, girlfriend at the time and Amir bought a house right over here so he could just walk over here every day. And and, and it was it was eight music, music people here in their and their girls like working all the time. And we would have parties and stuff. We had a Halloween party and we had all the Lincoln Park Gar Park guys would come down. And it was just a really, really, really fun time. Now, during that time, you know, Chester and I were both exploring the depths of drugs and alcohol, of course, Uh mm -hmm. You know, and that, you know, um, that's the dark side, you know, uh, he didn't pull out of it completely and oh. it ended up, you know, taking his life and almost did me. Um, when he died, I went to hell. I, 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 I started drinking, you know, when he died, I started drinking at 11 AM, you know, I, like, instead of drinking at like eight, you know, and drinking to like work. Oh. And just having a good time being a party animal. I started drinking as like a matter of course. I called it European style. Like, because I was like, well, in Germany, we drink for lunch. <laughs> so I just said, oh, no, I'm more European. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I'm an alcoholic. And so I was drinking because I couldn't, I didn't know what to do with what had happened. I didn't know where to go with it. I, I had no way to deal with it. I had no way to process it. So what I just did was the thing that I've always done, which was, you know, torture myself, beat myself up more, you know, walk the edge of suicide. And, um, oh and just God. really just be on the edge because that's how we are. That's how we were. It's how Chester and I were. And, um, and then finally when COVID hit, all my excuses dried up, all my restaurants closed. I own restaurants in Orange County, um, mm -hmm. here in LA, all my restaurants closed, all my tours got canceled. Everything ended. My girlfriend broke up with me and moved out. Face to and face, I, only with yourself, right? Yeah. Oh, that's, and I was that's si horrible. I was sitting by the, I sat at the pool with a cheap bottle of wine because I would drink so much. I would just buy the cheapest bottle because, you know, I mean, when you're spending a thousand dollars a week on alcohol, I mean, who fucking, you know, I mean, I was paying for the liquor store. I was paying their rent <laughs> on the corner. <laughs> and uh when i when i got sober i went in there i go hey guys how you doing they're all ryan where have you been <laughs> i go I, qu i quit drinking and i go how are you guys still in business and they all started laughing and i was like how do you how do you guys without me how do you even he's like, oh ryan there's many more of you <laughs> I was like, and i was like i know he's all but he goes but you are one of the best <laughs> he's all big spender <laughs> oh man but yeah when COVID hit I sat out at the pool crying, you know, my best friend was dead. My girlfriend just left me all my tours, 145 dates got canceled. My album had just came out and I can't go promote it. And we did it all independently. So we have everything. It's all our money. Gotcha. And then all my money, everything ended. <clears throat> and I just sat there with a bottle of wine and I was like, fuck, well, I better, I better call some girls. You know, better, better have girls over because that makes everything better. And, uh, you know, even that was like, well, it's COVID right now. You can't really have a bunch of chicks over and have a party. What the fuck? And so then I started thinking, I was like, you know what? I should, you know, oh, oh, and we were, we had to shoot some live stream material. We had to do some acoustic performances because some festivals we were playing got canceled and they uh -huh. asked us to send a video and I couldn't, it took me three days to do one acoustic song. I couldn't sing. I was losing my, I was losing my, myself. And so I was like, okay, I can't sing. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And I go, you know what? I should just try rehab and see how it goes. And if I hate being sober, I can always buy the liquor store on the corner, right? Yeah. Drink, yeah. drink all of it and then kill myself in the pool and fall in the pool. And that'll look really cool. Really? And that's how, that's how sick I was. These yeah. Were the thoughts? <clears throat> oh, it was the plan. Oh, so it's like, God. if I don't like it, I'll just, I'll, I'll literally, it, I'll just go, I'll rush towards death. 
Like, we'll just, we'll go for it. And I'll just, uh, you know, so that's how fucked up I was. And so I made a call, did it at the rehab people, the, the ambulance came and picked me up and, uh, took me to rehab. And, um, I spent, uh, I spent 75 days, 40 days, I think in, and then another, like, you know, 50 something days or something like that on, uh, you know, on, on outpatient, um, which mm -hmm. had to be zoom, unfortunately, because of COVID, but yeah. Yeah, it was heavy duty. So yeah, so then I got sober and then I had to kind of figure out how to sing again, you know, by doing that live stream and sounding shitty and being embarrassed because it's out there. You can watch it, you know, and I'm singing good. And then I tried to do a scream and nothing ca comes out and people are like this fucking guy. <laughs> and, you know, but, but, you know, that's, that's part of what we do. You know, then I, then I just drop that single and just go, yeah, well, by the way, fuck you. This is what I do, you know, but <laughs> I had to, I had to figure out how to do it all again. And I think now I'm better than I ever was, you know, better than that's, I ever was. That's amazing. And you know what you said about it, like uh, Chester and the Chris Cornell thing, it's like almost, it, it was like one year in between, I guess, almost. Yeah, bro, listen, um, thanks a lot for being here. For me, it's really cool because, you know, like since the orange days and then the Jillian, that, that by Cyrus, by the way, one of my like all time favorites albums wow. ever. Thank you. And, and Thank I was you. surprised with Edema, really. Thank you. Today, um, I have watched the video. Oh, I I don't remember the the title of the song. It's like live with you know with the gear. Yeah, uh, it was either Violent Principles or Ready to Die. Yeah, exactly. And there was part with the screaming, and it was amazing. Yeah. for me. Ready to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So man, yeah, yeah. And that. Thanks. I'm so glad Thanks. you are sober now, and I I didn't know about that at all. And yeah. Thanks or honesty that that's important yeah. for me really well especially for the ukrainian fans we uh pray for you guys and think about you daily our our hearts break for you guys and we just want you guys to all be safe and feel love from us in america and uh we uh, you, you would not even believe how much of a topic of conversation you know you guys are and how much my friends and everyone think of you guys so um we are with you and for all the fans out there that love dead by sunrise edema orgy and julian k we love you and we appreciate you and you guys have made my life so thank you so much and alex it's awesome to be on here with you i love your work love your uh your education and your talent i think it's super fucking cool i love that this is something that's accessible to people thanks brother thanks a lot